covering the world of professional wrestling. This is the Signature Spot with Chris Toplak. Three, two, one. Thank you very much for tuning into the latest episode of the Signature Spot with Chris Toplak. As always, I greatly appreciate your ongoing support, and I have all throughout 2018. Now, I know many are probably going to have that very typical line of, wow, this year just went by in a hurry. I'm the opposite. I felt as though this year, 2018 as a whole, moved like molasses or one of those 150-year-old tortoises. Just kept chugging along inch by inch. And yes, this was a year full of plenty of highlights, plenty that I thoroughly enjoyed. But at the same time, I feel as though 2019 is a bit of a clean slate and it's going to get bigger, better, and even more exciting. Not just related to the program, but just life in general, pro wrestling in general. The possibilities are endless. And I'm really happy for the WWE performers because if you recall, last year they were forced to perform on Christmas Day. Are you kidding me? Merry Christmas. Get your ass on the plane. You've got a job to do. You've got to entertain the fans. So the least they could do was tape Raw, tape SmackDown, and allow these performers who are traveling well over 200 days a year, perhaps even 250, to entertain us, the fans, let them relax, put up their feet, sip on some hot chocolate, and just enjoy the holiday season. I'm glad they finally have the opportunity to do that. Now, I mentioned, hey, 2018 is coming to a close, which means next week is the year-end show. That's right. I'm going to be dishing out awards. In fact, I call them the Toppy Awards. I stole that concept for something that I've actually been doing on Facebook. I actually had a live stream If you're a friend of mine on Facebook, I do it for all my friends and family. I hand out Toppy Awards. I've done it for eight years in a row. I'm bringing the Toppies to the signature spot. So that means best male wrestler in the WWE, best female wrestler in the WWE, et cetera, et cetera. So this entire next episode of the show, to close out 2018, will be dishing out awards. I'm really looking forward to it. Perhaps I'll have one or multiple guests. You never know. But enough about next week. How about this week? A full recap of TLC, Raw, SmackDown, NXT, big talent changes in ROH, some new faces, and some old that have parted ways, and I answer your questions. That's right. If you ever want to ask me questions, engage with me on social media. Like the Signature Spot on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Ask all the questions you like, and perhaps I'll even answer them on the program just like today. Your weekly recap. Strap yourself in. We've got a lot to cover, starting with WWE TLC. It was fairly predictable in terms of the outcomes, but overall, I felt this was an undeniable home run, at least in my eyes. And I entered it perhaps the best way that you could with realistic expectations. I was not a grizzled fan with my arms crossed, thinking, impress me like it's the Coliseum. And then on the flip side, I didn't go in there expecting like a WrestleMania caliber pay-per-view. Again, predictable. I was... 11 for 12 for my predictions, but there were many highlights and standout moments, including Buddy Murphy and Cedric Alexander. They had the crowd on their feet during the pre-show, and for God's sakes, put them on the main card. They've more than earned it. They deserve it at this point. You should relegate the pre-show to talent that really needs to start paying their dues, and those two actually have, especially over the past eight months to a year, but put it on For people who really need to pay their dues, they need to grow, or perhaps it is a form of punishment and you relegate them to that pre-show. The Fabulous Truth won Mixed Match Challenge. It's always a mouthful for me. Which means Carmella and R-Truth will enter their respective Royal Rumbles in spot number 30. Now, here's my early prediction. R-Truth either enters the Women's Royal Rumble by mistake or the Men's Royal Rumble at number 1 instead of number 30. And then he chose... WWE headquarters in beautiful Stamford, Connecticut for their all-expenses-paid vacation. It was silly, but it was still very entertaining. The triple threat tag match was expectedly exciting. That actually could have kicked off the card, and it would have been a great way to set the pace and the tone for the rest of the show. Baron Corbin is no longer the general manager of Raw. Round of applause. Braun Strowman 
earned a title opportunity against Brock Lesnar. That is for the Universal Championship at Royal Rumble. I love the fact, and you hear me speak about this quite often, there was actually a payoff in this feud. We got what we wanted. And whether you love or hate her, one could never deny that Ronda Rousey always puts on one hell of a show during every pay-per-view match. She really allowed Nia Jax to shine, who is, quite frankly, hit or miss. She can be in there with some great opponents and still falls flat, but here, again, she truly shined. Kurt Angle and Ronda Rousey both have caught on to this business far more quickly than what should ever be imaginable. So kudos to her. She's only going to get better with time. And even if you deny it, it's going to happen. You just wait and see. Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles feels like our modern day Shawn Michaels versus Bret Hart feud. And ladies and gentlemen, this is pro wrestling at its finest. They crafted one brilliant story, and I enjoyed the ending as well. It made sense to have Daniel Bryan retain the WWE Championship. The banter between Renee Young and Corey Graves during Rollins versus Ambrose was genuinely entertaining, but the match just fell flat. Obviously, we know that based on the non-reaction from the audience, and then the fact they started to boo and chant, this is boring. Now, I feel bad for Rollins the most because there's all these rumors that he's primed to take on Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania. And then you hear those, and it almost, ugh, like it just makes me sick because I feel bad for him. He has earned that spot, but it was just a total mess. When the storyline first started, it felt foolproof. Really did. But it's obvious it was too good to be true. And as we saw, the crowd lost interest very quickly. Perhaps they just need to completely part ways because nobody cares about the Shield anymore and they're just totally over it. Whether they're together or as a feud, it's just not working. And of course, the triple threat. Those three women beat the holy hell out of each other. And they took some gnarly bumps too. How about Becky landing directly on Charlotte on the table? It, it was audible. The reaction too, just oh, gut wrenching. If only JR was calling that match, he would take it up another notch. And then, due to Ronda Rousey's interference, Asuka, the Empress of Tomorrow, the champion of today, is your new SmackDown Women's Champion. Unbelievable. That was very noteworthy to conclude the show. Match of the night for me, no doubt about it, it was the triple threat. Becky Lynch versus Charlotte versus Asuka, not too far behind for me, though, was AJ Styles versus Daniel Bryan, a close second. Again, it was a solid pay-per-view, and it's amazing how one solid pay-per-view, and Ryan Bowman said this recently, can make up for months worth of poorly scripted television. My rating is a 7.5 out of 10. And then we move over to Raw, and the expectations were really high here because Vince McMahon had a major announcement fueling speculation that is, is going to be a new draft, going to call up some performers from NXT. What are they going to do? Because clearly they need a ratings boost. Well, Vince McMahon shows up. Of course, still receives a pop louder than 90% of the roster. Yes, of course, he is the CEO, the creator, the puppet master, but still, he's amazing on television, even though he's starting to look like Steve Buscemi, the older he gets, it's really uncanny and strange. Triple H, Shane, Stephanie all showed up. So the four of them collectively promised they have vowed that they will rescue Raw. And they also promised further, just like Bob Dylan, the times they are a-changing. Triple H promised new faces, new superstars, and new matchups, which I already thought, okay, given his history, given his creative flair in NXT, we're going to see some debuts soon. According to him, the audience, that's us. We are the new authority now. Logistically, I'm not sure how that works, but still, I get the basis of what they're hoping to do. But it still felt like same old, same old, as they opened Raw with about a 10-minute promo and then Barry Corbin came out. So the translation here was NXT call-ups. It proved to be accurate. A graphic revealed... The following individuals being called up from NXT. Again, we don't know if they're going to be on Raw or on SmackDown, but it's Lars Sullivan. Saw those vignettes recently. 
Lacey Evans, I think a tad too early, but perhaps I'm going to be proven wrong. EC3, who is more than ready from a character development standpoint to be on the main roster. Heavy Machinery, which surprised me, and long overdue, Nikki Cross. What are your thoughts on those six? Now, many have been claiming, where's Adam Cole? Where's the Velveteen Dream? Where's Champa? The problem is, is you don't want a depleted NXT. They still need to fuel that promotion. They still need to develop storylines and characters. So it's going to be a little bit before we see the Aleister Blacks, the Velveteen Dreams of the World called up to the main roster, but perhaps in early 2019. Now, Kurt Angle made his in-ring return against Baron Corbin. And while it closely resembled the beatdown Corbin endured just one night prior, it was still pretty satisfying. Plus, here's some good news. Sami Zayn will be returning soon and not far behind. Good buddy, friend and foe, Kevin Owens. That will be a much-needed boost to Monday Night Raw. Then, to conclude the show, Natalia versus Alicia Fox versus Dana Brooke versus Bailey versus Mickey James versus Ember Moon versus Ruby Riot versus Sasha Banks. It was a gauntlet match. It lasted over 53 minutes and it was just far too long. I also didn't like the way Stephanie just demanded each woman follow her on stage. Get on the stage! Like she's barking orders. It just didn't make sense. And while the McMahons promised a new regime and some substantial changes on Raw, we didn't really see any. And if we will, perhaps when we will, it likely won't be until 2019. Over to SmackDown. So let me get this straight. Paige was undoubtedly the best GM in SmackDown history. You can challenge me on that, but I believe that she has to be, in the very least, like a one or two option there. And yet, she's relieved of her duties. It's kind of like a thanks, but no thanks. Like the job you did, Paige, but you're out of here. That's like benching your star quarterback because they're throwing too many touchdown passes. That's like firing or demoting the best person in your office despite the fact that they are overachieving. It just There's no logic in this. So, fine. Let them reinvent the wheel on Raw, but leave SmackDown alone. It's perfectly fine. Either way, there's still a solid episode of SmackDown. SmackDown might be the house that AJ Styles built, but Daniel Bryan is adding a sizable addition to that house. He's got his tools out. He's ready to go. And I will just say this for the record. Heal Daniel Bryan better than babyface Daniel Bryan. I know many may may be surprised by that, but at the same time, if you see the work that he's doing as of late, unreal. And how about Daniel Bryan in that sign? That was the highlight of SmackDown for me. There was a fan that held up a sign and it said, yes, this sign wasted paper. The reaction from Daniel Bryan, priceless. Could have been a MasterCard commercial. And then, of course, AJ Styles and Mustafa Ali versus Daniel Bryan and Andrade Siena Almas. It was a solid match. It allowed each of the four competitors to shine. But that said, Mustafa Ali stole the show by pinning the WWE champion. That is how you groom the future. That is how you make a statement. He's a great babyface who fans genuinely root for and admire. I see nothing but potential in him. I'm genuinely happy that he's a permanent fixture on SmackDown. He deserves it. For the first time in nearly five months, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson appeared on television. Why would they bench one of the best tag teams on the main roster? Either way, they had a great little match with the Usos, which I would be in favor of seeing in the form of a lengthy feud. And then, of course... The Empress of today, the champion of today, Asuka versus Naomi. It was a very entertaining match. Vince McMahon made it clear to both Becky and Charlotte that if you have a problem with Ronda Rousey, why don't you go do something about it? So perhaps next week or maybe the week after because they did tape next Raw and next SmackDown. But early in 2019, that could be some of the changes that we start to see. Some new attitude from some of these wrestlers. Over to NXT, some of the highlights for me. Io Shirai and Dakota Kai versus Jessamine Duke and Marina Shafir. It wasn't necessarily a poor performance from Duke and Shafir, but it's clear they really have plenty of room to grow. But that's also a positive. Keep in mind, NXT is where young talent or new talent to the industry sharpen their teeth. They have a lot of potential. They'll get there. 
just going to take some time. Heavy machinery remains undefeated over the past six months, although a lot of those are squash matches, so you can add that to the mix. But now they will face the Undisputed Era next week. Now, with their most recent call-ups, you know the titles are by no means changing hands. And then factoring every show of the week, Aleister Black versus Johnny Gargano in a steel cage match was easily the best match of the week. It was a hard-hitting affair with plenty of near falls that was worthy of being on an NXT TakeOver show. And even furthermore, it could have been the main event, and I would have been fine with it. Gargano attempted to escape over the cage. He had Black crawling to the cage door. Tommaso Ciampa shows up. He slams the cage door onto the head of Black. We've seen that spot many, many times, but it's still gratifying. It's still entertaining. So basically, you have Aleister Black laying in the middle of the ring. You have Ciampa who entered the ring. Gargano has the opportunity to win the match. He has a clear path to victory. He's over the cage, onto the op- opposite side. But he decided not to jump down to the ground, not to climb down. Instead, he enters the cage again. You hear some DIY chants, and guess what happens? They actually landed their DIY knee and foot finisher to Alistair Black. And I love the way the show went off air. Eventually, they're staring at each other. Johnny almost this look of, oh my God, what did I do? Are we really this bonded now? And then, of course, they smile. They they both walk away. I still think of that quote from The Dark Knight. You either die a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. And that's Johnny Gargano to a T. He's a full villain now. So many layers to the story, though. Could this be Johnny's plan all along? To sucker Tommaso Ciampa into a championship match where he finally wins the big one? Or is he finally ready to join the black heart of NXT, the dark side. Who knows? But it makes for great television. The latest industry news and rumors. Following ROH final battle last Friday, the majority of the elite, along with SoCal Uncensored, are now officially done with the Ring of Honor. Let the speculation begin. This includes Cody and Brandy Rhodes, the Young Bucks, Hangman Page, Frankie Kazarian, Christopher Daniels, and Scorpio Sky. Do all signs point to the rumored all elite wrestling promotion? Or perhaps the WWE? Or somewhere else? Only time will tell. But of course, ROH needs to make up some ground. They lost a lot of key talent. They actually just signed Bandito. This was reported by Lucha Blog. The Lucha star Bandito signed an exclusive deal with the Ring of Honor. Hell of a get, by the way. According to PW Insider, Bandito reportedly agreed on terms with ROH last week after being pursued by several promotions, including the big time, the WWE. He's currently finishing up a tour with Dragon Gate, and he's expected to start with the company in early 2019. Now, if you don't know who Bandito is, you may know him from All In. He teamed up with Ray Phoenix and Ray Mysterio against the Young Bucks and Kota Abushi. Part two, man. That's right. Chris Jericho officially announced via Instagram that the Jericho Cruise second wave is happening. If you recall, a couple of weeks ago, I had Chris Ross on the program from the reaction room, and he was sharing his firsthand account of the Jericho Cruise. It sounded almost surreal. And if you want to be on this one, if you don't want to miss out, sign up for the newsletter at Chris Jericho Cruise. Dot com for all the details. Who, what, when, and where will all be released in January. An interesting tweet from bad boy Tamatonga, who wrestles under the New Japan Pro Wrestling banner. 2019, about to change the landscape again. You boys ready to do this again? And he tagged Carl Anderson, WWE, and Luke Gallows, WWE, in the tweet. Now, there's rumblings that those two may have a contract coming up to renew. Perhaps they don't. Or on SmackDown, if they're smart, they will finally utilize them as they did this past week because prior to that, they were sitting on the bench for five months. So if they aren't utilized more, if they don't receive more television time, perhaps a change of landscape to New Japan Pro Wrestling is on the horizon. 
Dave Meltzer is reporting that the Velveteen Dream is apparently in hot water after he asked fans to spam WWE's official Twitter account. I loved it. I was a part of it. I retweeted him. Why not? And this was with tweets during Monday Night Raw. He even had a whole bunch of hashtags. And he will encourage fans to basically use them. Now, I question the validity of this rumor based on the fact that the Dream routinely deletes all of his tweets. He's been doing this for about the past year now. So it's not out of the ordinary, and it just seems par for the course. The topic this week, your questions. That's right. I have brought back Ask the Top for one week only. You ask the questions, I answer them up next. Our topic of the week. Listen, I have no idea why I positioned this as if I was in some interrogation, or I was in the hot seat, like, you better tell us, buddy. We're going to get the truth out of you. You ask questions, I answer them on the show. It's that routine. It's completely unscripted. This entire show is unscripted other than some notes. So I want to answer these questions pretty genuinely from the heart on the spot. So the first one comes from JJ via Twitter. It's a great one. Really have to put some thought into this. Favorite cruiserweight wrestlers of all time. There's a ton of them. I mean, Dynamite Kid would be considered one for sure. And I've been saying that for years, not just because he recently passed away, but he has to be on my list. Chris Jericho would be super high. He was one of the main reasons I even you know, spent any time tuning into WCW. Because otherwise, I was always a WWF guy through and through. Juice and Thunder Liger. Talk about a classic. Love him. Same with Hayabusa. If you have not ever seen Hayabusa... Tragically passed away, I believe at age 48, he was confined to a wheelchair after a freak accident in the ring, but his body of work, the fact that he was such an innovator, loved him. Flying Brian Pillman, talk about another innovator. When it came to North American wrestling, he brought a lot of that Lucha Libre wrestling in that Japanese style, and he brought it to the U.S., and he popularized it over here. I thought he was fantastic, and also very ahead of his time. Ultimo Dragon. I look at him and I associate him with about like 19 different championships that he just holds on his arms. Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero. I would have to say those are my favorite cruiserweight wrestlers of all time. There's a couple here I'm going to combine. Edward via Facebook. In the McMahon's shoes, what changes will and should come? And then Mike Leochi via Facebook. What three big predictions you hope happens in 2019? I'll give you three, and this could apply to each of your questions. A more prominent focus on in ring action. I don't want silly segments. I don't want silly promos. If you're going to cut them, if you're going to include them on this show, make them matter. I just want to see more of a focus on the actual in ring product. More major call ups from NXT. I mentioned it earlier in the program, but how about Aleister Black and the Velveteen Dream? That would really rock the boat. And more freedom for talent to either sink or swim. That's the make or break situations we need to see. Bearded Warrior via Twitter. Who is the most overrated world champion? I don't know about most, but off the top of my head, and I doubt he even tops my list, but JBL comes to mind. And here's why. You know, he was fortunate to tango with some very incredibly talented performers such as Eddie Guerrero and Undertaker. But I always found his ring work to be fairly sloppy, especially for a long-time reigning world champion. I never saw him as anything beyond a mid-card worker. As a promo, quite entertaining though. But I don't understand how he ran SmackDown for so long. Again, it probably goes back to the Paul Heyman promo at ECW One Night Stand. The only reason you were champion on SmackDown for so, for so long was because Triple H didn't want to work Tuesdays. Steven via Twitter. Did you see the video of Sean Phoenix? I have no recollection of who Sean Phoenix is outside of this video. I've never heard of him. To catch you up, he's an independent wrestler. He suffered multiple injuries, which included a broken skull after he attempted a 450 splash to the outside of the ring. I've seen it before. I'm going to watch it in real time. It even says viewer discretion is advised here. We're going to skip to the part where it all happens. Oh, it's just so incredibly senseless. And legitimately, even watching the video, there has to be no more than 50, 60 people in attendance. 
Why risk your career for that? That is utterly ridiculous and irresponsible. And actually what's sad about it too is I remember clicking on the video and apparently Sean Phoenix posted it under his YouTube account. Are you really wanting this to be your claim to fame? The fact that you did a 450 splash to the outside of the ring and your skull bounced off the cement like a basketball. To me, as I noted, completely unnecessary. And this is not how you want to start your career or rise the ranks. You're literally going to be booked as the guy to nearly kill himself doing a senseless spot to the outside of the ring. Chris Jericho spoke about this at length on his podcast. Wrestlers really need to worry about longevity. He specifically noted this for the Dynamite Kid. He was forced to retire at 33. Not many remember that. But individuals like this will not stand the test of time with all of these ridiculous spots in front of 50, 60 people that nobody cares about. Is it really going to you know, boom all over the internet? Is his career going to take off like a rocket ship? I don't think so. And even with this, he'll receive his 15 seconds of fame and no one will remember his name. A quick and concise version of the signature spot with Chris Toplock flying solo this week. Hope you enjoyed it. One of the final editions of the show in 2018. On the weekend, I'm going to be in the little Bavaria, Frankenmuth, Michigan. It's a holiday tradition for me and the missus. We go down there, we eat, we drink, we spend time at the world's largest Christmas store, take in all the festivities, so I will be back refreshed next week. Hope you have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful holiday. For whatever you celebrate, I hope that it brings you joy. And until next Thursday, and again, a year-end show with awards. It's going to be good. I promise you. Tune in. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again. This concludes another episode of The Signature Spot with Chris Toplack. For new episodes, subscribe on YouTube. Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or iTunes. And don't forget to follow The Signature Spot on Facebook for exclusive clips, polls, and opinions.